Good afternoon. We welcome you to our noonday Bible study, and we're grateful that you have joined with us for this time of diving into God's Word and growing together. Uh, we invite you at this time, if you want to share this study so that you, it can be a blessing to others, take a moment just to click that share button, and that way we can continue to spread God's Word widely, and that it might have an impact greatly on all who would hear and take the time to experience this study with us. As we join together, we thank you and thank God for your presence virtually and for those who are also in person in the sanctuary joining in this hour of study with us. And as we come together in this time, we look forward to sharing and just thinking through uh, uh, rejoicing, uh, ridding rubbish to gain righteousness, ridding our lives of rubbish to gain righteousness. Very powerful study, and I believe it will begin to speak to us in some great ways to help us know how we continue in the pursuit of righteousness in our lives. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for another opportunity to study your word. We don't take it for granted or lightly that we can come together in this way. We thank you for the means of technology and those who uh, have found an robbery to come and share in this hour, uh, being present in the sanctuary with us as we come together this moment to take a time to look to your word, that your word continue to be hid in our hearts that we might not sin against you. We ask it all now in Christ's name we pray, amen. So as we share in the study, if you take a look, there's a picture on the screen and you see a wallet in one hand and a gentleman pointing to another finger pointing to it. This picture comes out of a, uh, an article from several years ago where a man realized some weeks later that he was missing his wallet. Several weeks after having gone on a vacation, he's missing his wallet. And although he had prepared for moments like this by putting a specific little tracker in his wallet, he did not expect to find, discover his wallet being where it was. When he did the locator on his wallet to find it, he found it was in a sanitation, uh, uh, a sanitation truck, and that truck had just, been, had just dumped all of its waste at the, the local area uh, where all the waste was being moved. And then that place, that junkyard, here his wallet remained. And so he called where it said the address was. And they said, if your wallet is here, you're more than welcome to come and look for it. And using the locator that was on it, he went to the junkyard. And when he goes there to the junkyard, he finds that there's a beeping sound that helped him find exactly where his wallet was amidst a great heap and pile of trash. So there he is going through this filth and stench and smelly garbage, old diapers and people's food remains and everything else that was foul was in this place. And here he goes in with a sanitation worker who helps him to dive and dig through to pull out the bag in which he found his wallet. And when he had this experience, what the man came to discover was more than just what was in his wallet, but what his wallet really had of value to and for him. For him finding his wallet and all that it had in it, he realized that it carried in it his identity, something he needed to know and show and prove of who he was. But also he came to discover and experience relationship. Because as he spent the time looking, he found the people who were there to help him find himself, know himself, and be assured of himself were just the kind of people he needed for the job that was ahead of him. And oftentimes when we look at our lives, we don't really realize all of the rubbish that often begins to become a, a, a part of our life, a part of our existence that we can be consumed or, or, or find our lives uh, overwhelmed by that can keep us from and so Paul as we look at this passage for today and flip will help us to see how we can get rid of our rubbish so that we can gain righteousness when we consider what it means to live a life of faith Martin Luther suggests that faith is living a daring confidence in God's grace so sure that the believer would stake their lives on it a thousand times. Faith is living a daring confidence in God's grace, 
so that we would stake our life on it a thousand times. And what he's helping us to see is that where we come to know who we are and trust who we are in Christ, we are so assured that our confidence in God's grace to be so sufficient to us, we won't doubt or we won't question what we have in that grace that God gives us through Jesus Christ, that we would live our lives determined in every way to experience more of Christ in our lives. The confidence in the grace of God truly finds its strength then in the ability to rejoice. Regardless of what you go through, you ought to be able to rejoice. When you have this confidence in the faith that God calls us to in Christ Jesus, of which we live and exist in the confidence that comes in God's grace through Christ Jesus, no matter what situations we face, no matter how bad things get, how difficult they look, we will have confidence in that grace. And as such, when confidence is placed in anything other than Christ, the ability to rejoice then becomes forfeited. It becomes forfeited because we will then begin to not realize what we're giving up because we put our confidence in everything else but Jesus Christ alone. And even scripture tells us to remember not to put our trust in man, but oftentimes we can find ourselves giving up our ability to rejoice because we've looked at everything else before we've looked at Jesus Christ. Therefore, as we look to the letter of Philippians to help us to reconcile what happens and what takes place when we have our confidence misplaced or put into the wrong things that takes us away or distances us from the grace of God that gives us confidence for our faith and that which also brings us into a place that challenges us to uh, be able to rejoice in difficult or challenging times in our life. We want to look at Paul's letter to Philippians to understand what it was that in his purpose of writing that he then leads us to gain for ourselves so that we can walk in the fullness of the confidence that we should have when our confidence is truly focused and situated in Jesus Christ. So when Paul wrote this letter, his main purpose was to reassure and strengthen fellowship with the saints at Philippi and with Christ. His desire was to express thanks and encourage continued joy despite the apostle Paul's present plight. When Paul wrote this, uh, uh, when he wrote this letter to the church at Philippi, he was writing to them from prison. Paul's present prison sentence, his time in prison, really challenged his relationship with the church at Philippi. Although they had been faithful to him and their giving, although they had uh, uh, endured the challenging times with him, they continued to maintain that consistent faithfulness. But with Paul's situation now, it challenged them. Even more, Epaphroditus, who was faithful and loyal in all he did for the church at Philippi, as well as what he did for Paul, had become ill, and they were concerned about him also. So Paul was really writing to say, even as Epaphroditus is suffering, it's going to be all right. Even as I'm in prison and we're not able to be in the fellowship or I'm physically present with you, we're still going to be all right because we still have a fellowship in Christ Jesus. And where Paul writes to them to encourage them in this way, to, give the, to, to, to point them towards joy in the midst of trouble, we also learn and discover that, that we can have such great joy. We can maintain our fellowship. We can be strengthened in our relationship with Jesus Christ when we realize that our ability to rejoice comes from that experience of being together regardless of the circumstances and challenges that we face. We, we face challenges, circumstances all the time. We face changes in our life. Those who we love who are with us now are no longer with us. Uh, we, we have those challenges where we see economics and social challenges that come against us. We have those community uh, situations that happen where crime and violence uh, are, are around us and we have these things go on, but yet we can still have joy in the midst of it all. And that's what Paul was trying to help them to see but he helped, needed them to understand that if this joy is to remain, 
you've got to be mindful and aware of where you place your confidence. Because if your confidence is in anything else but Christ, what you will find yourself is in a compromising situation where you can lose your joy. Therefore, Paul says in Philippians 3, 1 through 11, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee as to zeal, a persecutor of the church as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So Paul, in other words, is saying to us that, that there's a, a risk of misplaced confidence. And he starts off after calling us to rejoice, talking to the church of Philippi to rejoice. He then moves to show them the dangers of those who put their trust in anything else but Christ. So he starts off with those who put their trust in their flesh. And he speaks of those who he calls them several names. He said there are three things he points out about them. He says that, that they are dogs. He calls them dogs. If you know anything about dogs, dogs are, can be scavengers. Dogs will, will, will scurry around looking. They're always trying to find something. They're always trying to dig something up. They're always trying to find, get something or take hold of something. That, that's what dogs do. So he calls them dogs. He said they're, they're always after something or up to something. He also said they're evildoers, those who would do you harm, those who care not much about you but care more about themselves, and so they will use you for what makes them feel better about them. But he also says they're those who mutilate the flesh. So he calls them mutilators. And he's talking about the fact that they were circumcising those in the flesh because they were still trying to carry out circumcision, uh, 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 that which was up to, according to the law, rather than live according to the grace that's in Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul comes back and says, after he says this about them calling dogs, evildoers, and mutilators, to say that we are the circumcision. Not of the flesh, but of the heart. That means that we have, that, that, that's what he's talking about. And he says, we are the circumcision who what? Worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. And we put what? No confidence in our flesh. So Paul first says, you have to be aware of those on the outside who seek to do you wrong. But then you also have to make sure you're aware of what happens inside of you. Because oftentimes we see the attacks from outside and, and we can handle those. But sometimes we, we don't always deal well with what can cause us to misplace our confidence from within us. Because when we have fear, we can put our confidence in things that we think help keep us from fear. When we have anxiety, we think we can put our confidence in things that will help us navigate or manage our anxiety. When we have, those, uh, uh, we have broken relationships, we feel as though we can find things that will keep us confident in ourselves because of things we do to find a better relationship. Well, they left me. If they treated me wrong, that's why I wait till I get to the next relationship. When they get to the next person, they want to do everything to look good outwardly, but still be struggling inwardly. When we misplace our confidence, we will pursue after many things 
that never truly give us what we gain in Christ Jesus. It moves us away from living according to the righteousness that's by faith because we're now living by what is what we think is right by our own human existence. But if you live by only what's right by your own humanity, that means you will always be prideful in what you do instead of having the humility that was also in Christ Jesus. And Paul earlier in Philippians chapter 2, he said, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. He's speaking about that mind, that experience for us as believers that leads us to a humility, not a haughtiness. Most in their flesh are doing that which is prideful. They're not doing that which is humble. And oftentimes our humility will go out the door when we don't check the inward places of ourselves, the, the struggles that we deal with that keep us from walking in a true humility that accepts that there's nothing that we can do of ourselves that'll bring about what Christ has done for us. So Paul's helping us to understand this. And, and Paul says that maybe you'll get this better about the inward struggles. When you recognize what in the flesh I can claim for myself. Paul says, I want you to know what I can claim. And so Paul gives us his resume in Philippians 3 verses 4 through 6. Paul says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. Now you notice he said we don't put our confidence in the flesh because we, 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 what? we worship the Lord and we glory in Christ. But now Paul says, but, but just so you can understand this thing, that I don't want you just to be aware of the outside challenges that come against you, but to know that oftentimes you're so focused on what you handle out there that you don't deal with enough in here. And, and our inward struggles don't just meet us in one season of life, they meet us in every season of life. And that's the rubbish that can get in the way to keep us from righteousness. Paul says, he says, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, he says, I have more. Paul bragging, ain't he? Paul, Paul is bragging here. He said, I, I, I have more reason to have confidence. He, this is my confidence. Paul gives his resume. He says, I'm circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. Paul lays out a heavy resume of why he could trust in his flesh. Paul was the man. Paul had it going on. A Hebrew of Hebrews. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was, as to the law, a Pharisee. Paul had achieved prominence. Paul was sophisticated in society. He was the religious right in the midst of a world where everybody said anything else was wrong. He said, I had a zeal like nobody else. He said, I persecuted the church. He, he confesses it. And he says, this is all the things that I could say and boast and brag on myself. Paul lays out this resume because he wants us to realize how easy it is for us to get caught up in our degrees, get caught up in our successes, our travels, our triumphs. Oh yeah, we, we, we've got our own trophy case. We got our own resume of things. I, I, I spent 22 years in the military and, and I did a lot of things and I've got a lot of certificates and awards. Matter of fact, when I put my uniform on and you see the rack of my ribbons here, I, I could boast in all of those. And perhaps you've got some ribbons that you wear. There's some things that you still look at and you, you kind of smile about because you feel such a pride about them. You feel such a, a good thing about these things you've achieved. But Paul says, these, these things that I did, I could go on and on about and I'm justified in it in my flesh. And sometimes we live within those special moments. We live within those glory moments. We live within these great things that we've done and, and we don't realize how those things really don't mean anything if we boast in them, but not in the Lord. 
So Paul said, here's my resume. And he tells us his resume because he needs us to understand that misplaced confidence arises when what is believed is determined without sound reason. Hmm. See, when you put your trust in what a who has shown the ability to be insufficient in and for what it is sought, it will always lead to failed expectations. Sometimes we put so much trust and confidence in the things we've done, the places we've been, the things we have, and we put so much there that we don't realize that, that at some point all of those things are going to fail us. They're not going to keep us. Because you can have the baddest car in the neighborhood, but that don't keep you out of the hospital. You can have the nicest house on the block with the most beautiful manicured lawn. That don't mean you won't have a moment day when you will have someone cutting the grass around your tombs, your headstone. All of us have some things we will have, but if we put our expectations and trust in those things, we will have a failed expectation by them all because they will at some point end. So let's talk about that. What are some things in which trust has been placed only to experience their failure? People. Ah. You ever put your trust in some people and they let you down? And you get upset because you just knew they were going to do all they said they were going to do. They said they're going to be there for you. They're going to pick you up on time so y'all can go hang out. Then they don't show up. Oh, yeah, I'm going to pay you that money back. 20 years later, you're still waiting on that $20. People have said some things and we put a confidence in them and they've let us down. And, and, and yet, when we deal with people letting us down, it can disappoint us, it can frustrate us, it can cause us then to also live out of our flesh and try to find out how we can either do something to prove we don't need them no more. Or we don't have to worry about that because we'll find somebody else that'll help us out, that'll look out for us because they couldn't do it. When we put our confidence in people, people let us down. And it's disappointing because you, you really want to believe and have some confidence in the people who say they will do and who say they're your friend that, and, and are, they, they, they say blood is thicker than water and they're your family and they're going to be there for you. They're your ride or dies and then all of a sudden you find they do more dying than riding. So, so we have to realize we, we sometimes put our confidence in people. And that's a misplaced confidence where we keep getting let down. And sometimes we keep getting let down because we keep going to people with the same thing that have no capacity to do anything better. So, so when we consider that, we must realize that Scripture teaches us not to put confidence in man. And, and I'm going to show you that sometimes people outwardly aren't always the ones that we've misplaced our confidence. Sometimes we have misplaced confidence in ourselves. Because Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not people, the Lord. And do not lean your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Watch this now. Verse 7 says, Be not wise in your own eyes. Sometimes we want to point out the people who did us wrong. But we don't always want to confess about what we've done wrong to ourselves. That we were our own problem. Come on. Sometimes we're like Jonah. We're the problem, but we don't always want to confess it. We're, we're the ones who, 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 who create more issues than we have opportunities. So, so we got to be not wise in your own eyes. Watch this. It says, fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So if you want to help yourself, you want to overcome things, trust in the Lord. Don't be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord. So between the trust in the Lord and the fear of the Lord, we can find that, that our confidence is better placed there than in people, even ourselves. And I know that kind of challenges us because sometimes we think we're pretty good at what we do. We, we usually get things done. We achieve things. We're not procrastinators. I, I, every time I'm given something, I get it done. I see it through. But even in the midst of that, you may not procrastinate. Well done, girl. I'm proud of you. Good job. Sometimes you, 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 you set your task and you're task-oriented. But what do your tasks sometimes take you away from that needs your attention? 
Because sometimes we can be so task-oriented that we miss the relationships we get to experience. The people who need us, well, I can't go see about them. I can't do this right now because I got to do this right here. But when we trust in the Lord, we come to realize that the Lord will help us to discover the things we need and that are beneficial to us far greater than the things that sometimes we associate and direct our lives through that are not consistent with who he is to us. So we ought to trust the Lord and fear the Lord, especially when we find ourselves at times putting our confidence in people that doesn't always prevail in the way we expect. But also, then also there's possessions. We, 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 we put our confidence sometimes in our possessions that we think if we don't have enough, we go and try to buy most of so we can get all we think we need. Then you buy all these things and then you can't do nothing with them. You, you, you buy a boat, buy an RV. And then doctor says, well, I have some good news and bad news. Good news is you'll be okay. The bad news is you can't travel far. So you now can't utilize these things. You, you, you've desired these things because you felt like they would give you some security, some certainty, some assurance about your possessions. And oftentimes, sometimes the possessions are all we buy of things we think we need. Sometimes the possessions we go after are things that we pursue that we think give others an understanding of who we are. We pursue things that give others a sense of thinking that we are better off. But when we buy these things, we're actually more broke than we are better. Then they wonder why we don't see you around because you're trying to compensate for where you're broke because you're balling stuff to try to look better. But what the scripture teaches in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, he said, do not live for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves, what? Treasures in heaven. Neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If our heart is is where our treasure would be, then our treasure ought to be in the one who has given us abundant life. And that's Jesus Christ. And when Jesus gives us life more abundantly for our heart to be there, the treasure there, then we seek and desire after the righteousness that comes by faith in him. Such confidence in that righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ, then is a greater place to place our confidence and what he makes us to possess, rather than all the things we try to possess to define and determine our lives for ourselves. There's also professions, our jobs, our careers, and we definitely go to work. This is not saying don't work. This is not saying don't go get a job. This is not saying don't go to school, but, but we cannot allow ourselves to put our confidence in that alone. Because when you only are focused on your profession, when you think that your profession is all that there is to life and existence for your experience of life, you put your confidence in your profession, get the job, get the corner office, become the CEO, and then the company goes through a, 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 a realignment and your position gets, kicked, gets moved out. Now you have no job. Or you own the job and you've been working 20 plus years and then all of a sudden they tell you, well, we got to let you go just short of when you should get your retirement. See, when you put your confidence in your profession to provide and assure you of everything you think that you should have and will have for your life, you can find that your profession can let you down. But Colossians 3, 23 to 24, says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, that beyond what may happen in your profession, what may happen as you pursue the career here, but then found that you had to shift and go pick up a new career there, that you can still have your inheritance intact where you work towards the Lord. Can I help somebody today that may be on this live stream and share something with the folks who might need to tell somebody about their job? 
You can be on a job with a jerk boss, but don't let your jerk boss cause you to lose your job. Don't put so much confidence in your job and in the people who are over you on your job that you let them determine how you do your job. No, you keep working as if God is your boss, as if God is your CEO. You keep working as if God is the one who did your interview, as God is the one who's going to make sure your paycheck comes. You work unto the Lord, and if you work unto the Lord and trust him and remain confident in him, no matter how crazy the people are on your job, you can keep your job and you can have that job success and God will deal with them as time goes on. Either we look to, to Joseph, Joseph in Potiphar's house. Joseph was second to Potiphar in his home. Dealt with everything, mastered day to day, was successful, but yet Potiphar's wife had eyes for Joseph. Joseph remained faithful even when she became flirtatious with him and she tried to get the best of him to where she ultimately played a game that cost him the job he had. But watch what God does. Even when he lost that job in the prison, God still elevated Joseph. Sometimes we get so focused on how people are and we want to deal with people on their level rather than stay faithful to God on the level he's called us to, that we can get caught up in our profession to the place where we turn away from God to deal with man. And when we do that, we can end up in worse situations than we could if we just stay faithful to God. Because God can always give you another job. God can always give you a promotion. God can also move you to a place and give you that which is going to take care of you. But you've got to stay focused on him and know that your living and your experience now is also a setup for the inheritance that you have for your future. Don't forfeit what God has for you. Rejoice in the midst of people treating you wrong. Rejoice in the midst of the struggles you may face. Rejoice in the midst of how people put you down and don't want to pick you up. Rejoice when you see people who don't show up to work half the time, but yet they got the promotion on the job. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul says to us. And again, I say rejoice. Don't put your confidence in your profession. Put your confidence in Christ. But also, we talk about paraphernalia. Paraphernalia looks at anything we think gives us something that either takes an edge off or reassures us in some false way. So we say paraphernalia, we're looking at everything. We're looking at those who think happy hour is going to make you all feel better. Uh, not realizing every time you go to happy hour, you, 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 you're not going to be as happy as you thought you'd be once you leave, or especially the next day. Or, or, or that paraphernalia may be some, something else that you have found yourself connected to that you feel you need to satisfy you in life where you're struggling in life. I, I know we, your, your mind can run rampant with some things, and, and I believe that if you, you keep them within the parameters of what you know paraphernalia to be, there's many different paraphernalia that people use or have sought after to bring them some kind of ease or comfort in the midst of difficult times. But Proverbs 22, 3 gives us a word of wisdom about putting our confidence in paraphernalia. It's a word of wisdom. And I believe it's a word of wisdom that we need because sometimes we can, we can talk against people who think that uh, the alcohol is the thing they need. Uh, the, 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 the secret rendezvous are the things they need. Or, or, or the pornography and things of that nature what we need to take an edge off. But, but, you, but we don't all need to attack them, but give them the word of God that gives wisdom to us. And wisdom to us as well, because we're not far removed from a hard moment that can have us doing something that, that we think we need to help us in our hardship. Hard moments will look, have you sometimes looking for things that bring you comfort. Even if you think shopping is going to help you in your hardship, <laughs> you're going to go and shop hard so you can deal with the hard heart and the hurt that you have. So Proverbs 22, 22, 3 says, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Hmm. 
the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Hiding yourself means that you seek a place of safety. The place of safety for us is to run to the presence of God. When we find ourselves seeing the dangers of paraphernalia that, that come close to us. So when we run to his presence, we know that he shall hide us in the tabernacle. He, he shall keep us close to him. But you got to run to God when you see the danger. So when we see the danger, we ought to be assured of the promises that God gives us that he will hide us if we'll seek the hiding in him rather than going out and being simple and suffering. Suffering because you end up in there to have to go through a time in your life where you've got to uh, uh, reroute everything that's your experience and deal with what now has caused you shame because you chose it rather than him. Suffer because you now are dealing with trying to, to be uh, uh, secretive about what everybody else can see you're dealing with. So now you don't come to church. Now you're not in study. Now you're not in fellowship with other believers because you're trying to, to, to be secretive because you were the simple that's suffering. But don't let the simple suffering that you go through keep you so far because you can always come back and find a hiding in him, a rest in him, knowing that he will make you glad. A paraphernalia is another place where we can put ourselves in a place of misplaced confidence. But then also posterity. We can put our confidence in our children. We can put it in them to the point where we don't realize how it messes up things in our life because we've trusted and counted on our children to do stuff for us and take care of us and to go do great things for us. And when it don't work out for them, we're, we're looking at them and we're disappointed. One well, of my favorite movies uh, uh, that I've, I've watched over the years uh, uh, is, is Boys in the Hood. You might be familiar with the movie Boys in the Hood. Uh, with Ice Cube and, and uh, uh, the other dark-skinned brother all the sisters go crazy about. Uh, uh, Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but in the movie Boys in the Hood, the younger brother is the football star. And mama is banking on the football star to the point where she mistreats the older son. She's so wrapped up in the younger son that she doesn't acknowledge the older son. She talks down to the older son. She mistreats the older son. And when the younger son dies, so dies her dreams in him. And even if we look at scripture, there, there was two, two brothers who got treated the same way. Daddy loved one, mama loved the other. Jacob and Esau. Jacob was mama's boy. Esau was daddy's boy. And they had so much confidence and trust in them, but didn't realize that Esau was going to upset daddy and Jacob was going to stir up everything. But in Jacob's doing, Jacob would eventually come to know God and turn his life around. He would then become a part of that promise that God had made, but in the midst of it, there was a tension in the home because each of them preferred a child over the other. And oftentimes in homes today, younger children can be mistreated because they may not be in the same place or do the same things that the older child does. Or the older child may not do what the younger child does. The younger child seems so smart, so bright, go to school, don't cause a problem, get all their work done. Oh, wonderful child, you're going to do great things. I know you're going to do it. I know when you're going to take care of mama, you're going to take care of daddy. Older child goes to trouble, goes to school, gets in trouble, always getting in a fight, always is a, always suspended from school, and they get mistreated. And when they're mistreated, the one that's younger that you put the confidence in becomes the one that upsets you when they get older. And the older one that didn't, you got all mad with, is the one now you're begging and pleading for them to take care of you. Why? Because you put a confidence in them by putting on them expectations to take care of you rather than trying to raise them up so they know how to live a life for Christ. Even Psalms tells us that we ought to be mindful of not putting our confidence or putting our, 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 all our, 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 the weight of our hopes and expectations and dreams on our younger 
but raise them up so that even when they struggle and fall, even when they go through challenges, they can learn how to what? Turn around, repent, reconcile from those issues they may have. But it says right there in Psalm 146.3, it says, put not your trust in princes, in a son of man on whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to earth, and on that very day his plans perish. What it's saying is, it talks about princes. No, they didn't say kings, it said princes. Princes are young. Princes are naive. Princes are still learning. And a son of man, which talks about those who have been impacted by the experience of Adam, that's what the son of man in the Hebrew here is talking about those who had been impacted or are under the influence of Adam. Y'all know what happened with Adam, don't we? He ate, the tree, he ate the fruit from the tree in the garden that he was not supposed to eat of. So we found what? Sin came through the first Adam. But life comes through who? The second Adam, Jesus Christ. So through the first Adam is who the psalmist is referring to. He said, because they can't save you. And sometimes we want the younger people to save us. We want them to be what helps us go on. But we cannot put them in a place of doing something that they can't do. We must trust the one who truly saves us, who is God, who has given us salvation through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we must be mindful of the things that we can put our confidence in that's misplaced, rather than putting our confidence in the one, Jesus Christ, who also allows us to know how we can obtain his righteousness according to the will of God for our lives. Paul says that, and Paul helps us understand that. Let's go back to our text. Because after Paul talks about his resume, he said, but whatever, I gain, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He said, I refuse to place my confidence in the things I've accomplished. I refuse to let my, 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 my confidence be placed in things that I've done, the way I've done them, and how I've done them, and how they can be celebrated how they can be acknowledged, how they can be, uh, uh, I, I can be um, praised for them. He said, I'm not putting my confidence there. He said, whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. He said, indeed, I count everything as loss. This is verse 8. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Hmm. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that what? It depends on faith. Here it is. So Paul said, if you're going to get rid of the rubbish so you can have righteousness, you've got to know what it is that is the rubbish in your life. And the rubbish are the things that we have place confidence in but that have let us down so when we remove those things to pursue righteousness we will find that the righteousness that come by faith avails to us an experience of Christ more intimately so what is the benefit of confidence in Christ first of all it's the righteousness that we gain the righteousness that comes through Christ for us because we cannot make our own righteousness. We cannot prove ourselves by any righteousness we think we have. Scripture says, for our righteousness is like filthy rags in the nostrils of God. So what righteousness do we have? But when we pursue the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ, we know that the righteousness that Jesus gives to us, the right standing that he gives to us in relationship uh, uh, with God through Jesus Christ, is because of what Christ did to give us or impute to us righteousness. In his suffering and his death and his burial and his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus accomplished for us the righteousness that is from God. So when God sees us, he sees us according to the righteousness that Jesus gives to us by faith. Therefore, Faith is essential, not only to the experience of righteousness, but for recognizing the things that do not make us righteous before God. So that we don't go to God saying, well, God, I did this, I did that, look at this, God, look at that, and start trying to prove ourselves to God. 
God says, you don't have to prove yourself to me. He says, I, I know who you are. I, I, I've seen your life. I, I, I knew where you were. I understood the things about you that you didn't even understand about yourself because I am God. And if God understands and knows it, he, saw, he also tells us and lets us know that we needed him to work the work of righteousness for his name's sake that we might be righteous before him because nothing we could do could ever make us right. Nothing. So the benefit of confidence in Christ versus having a confidence that's misplaced is that we can know the righteousness fully that comes by faith. But also the benefit of confidence in Christ brings us to experience the suffering of Christ. Now I know suffering don't sound like a benefit, does it? It don't feel good to suffer. But we have to understand that if we suffer with Christ, we also shall what? Reign with Christ. So your suffering truly is a benefit. Suffering means that you might go through some things, but it doesn't mean that the things you go through will get the best and better of you. It does not allow you to stay in a place where you go through and think that it's all over in that moment. Because even as we suffer in this world, even as we go through the things we go through, our present suffering is nothing in comparison with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So when you're going through and you find yourself struggling, just remember there will be glory after this. If there's glory after this, that ought to cause you to rejoice. Because I, I, I sometimes find myself when I'm going through some hard moments and I just can't figure it out and I'm wondering why am I have to deal with this? Why is it I'm struggling right now? Why is it that my family is, is, is having these issues? Why is it that I'm seeing people be this way when we're doing all we can to care and love for them and, and nurture their, them in the way of Christ Jesus? All that you do for others and, and it seems like the suffering is overwhelming but if we remember what it took for us to now have the salvation we had, it took a great suffering. But in the great, after the great suffering came a great salvation. And if there's a great salvation after great suffering, don't think that your suffering is the end, but there's a glory that's coming beyond this that you can rejoice and be glad about. I know you might be talking about me now. You might be putting me down. You might not like me. You might not care about me, but I'm all right because there will be glory after this. I'm not going to cuss you out. I'm not going to put you down. I'm going to love you with the love of Jesus. I'm going to be patient. I ain't going to have a lot of words with you. I'm going to be silent while you run your mouth and let you do the things you do because you think that what you're doing is hurting me. No, it's helping me because I'm seeing the glory that he's working in me because I know the glory that he promised would be in me. Benefits, confidence in Christ. Paul says also, there's righteousness, there's suffering, and there's the resurrection. Paul says we want to know the resurrection. That's what he says in those last verses. He calls us to, to recognize the resurrection, and he talks about the resurrection in such a profound way. He says that we want to know the power of the resurrection. Hmm. The power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection of Jesus is that power that is at work in us right now. But you can't know the power of the resurrection if you still have a confidence place in everything else but the one who was resurrected for you. So when we recognize Jesus' resurrection, we're recognizing that he got up with what? All power in his hand. If he has all power in his hand, he has all authority, then the has power, what? Not just in his death, in his burial, but in his resurrection. The power in the resurrection is a resurrection to what? New life. You can't experience new life living in old ways. You can't experience new life that, that promises life not only now, but life eternal if you keep putting your confidence in the things that keep failing in this life. Because you'll keep chasing after those things and miss the power of the resurrection that leads you to this life that Christ gives. 
Christ is the giver of life, then we all are the desire to know that life that is not only in this life, but beyond this life. Living a, the life in the power of the resurrection means that you realize that there's a change that is happening in you that is transforming you from one glory to the next. As we move from one degree of glory to the next, we discover the power of the resurrection helps us to deal with some things in this time of our life in a way we hadn't dealt with them before. It helps us to realize we, 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 we are not, we don't stoop to some folks' level like we used to. We stay at the level where we are in Christ. Some people are trying to pull you down, but you keep on staying where you are because he's leading you higher. You don't get stirred up by some of the things that used to agitate you, frustrate you, get the better of you. No, you continue to go up because what? He keeps you. The power of resurrection is not just a power to make you, it's also a power to sustain you. And sometimes we need his power to sustain us because in that sustaining, we can experience the grace of God to deal with us here to get some stuff out of us so we can go to the next level. Because you can't go up until you deal with some stuff. You don't become greater in the power of the resurrection until you let him wrestle with some of those things that you have not yet let go of because we still have some places of misplaced confidence. We still wrestle with some things that we really hope would be better than they are, but they just keep on yielding the same thing and have not changed, and we have not let go of them and said, Lord, we give it unto you because I can't do nothing with it. So we need that sustaining and experience the grace of God so that those places in us, those things in our life that we still have put confidence in, hoping that something will happen to them that probably won't happen, so that we can then turn to him and let go of those things and be able to find in the midst of it who we are. Paul says this, in all of that that he helped them understand, he says, when you realize what righteousness by faith is, what happens when you suffer, and know the power of the resurrection, you discover who you are. You discover who you are. Because no longer are you putting your confidence in everyone around you and things around you, things you could have, paraphernalia, any of those things. You're not putting confidence out there. You're trusting the one who gave you life. The one who has given you new life. And you begin to know who you are. When you know who you are as a child of God, when you know who you are because you are a co-heir with Christ Jesus, when you know who you are, that he says that you are more than conquerors, when you know who you are, when you can cry out, Abba, Father, because you know that you are his child and he hears your cries and your prayers, knowing who you are is the greatest thing to keep you from putting confidence in things that won't do you any good. No confidence in our flesh, but great confidence in Christ. To know who you are enables you to rid your life of the rubbish that comes from misplaced confidence. To know Jesus Christ is to know oneself. This keeps you from being double-minded, and in every situation, you can rejoice. Paul, Paul kept telling him rejoice throughout the letter. He was trying to help them see something that he was learning in the midst of his prison experience. Though in prison, Paul was still joyful. He was still thanking the Lord, praising the Lord, looking to the Lord, because he realized even in the present circumstance, he knew who he was in Christ Jesus. Don't let your circumstances dictate the places you begin to then look to for confidence that end up taking you into places and spaces that distance you from the goodness of God for you. Know his righteousness, experience your suffering, Trust the power of the resurrection, not only to have saved you, but to sustain you and to bring you into great experience of God's grace and know who you are through the experience of it all. Because then you'll be able to declare, as the songwriter says, oh, the joy of knowing Jesus. Anybody want to know Jesus? You want to know Jesus. It is dawning on my soul. I am finding his salvation 
and the power that makes me whole. We rid our lives of the rubbish of things that can get in the way, of things that we should count as rubbish, that we should consider to be nothing in comparison with what we come to know of Christ. We can then pursue his righteousness, encounter him in our suffering, know him in the fullness of all that he brings us into through the power of his resurrection and be confident in who he said we are. Just as that man found his wallet that had his identity and also found relationship through that experience of salvaging through the rubbish to find, so too when we go through our rubbish, say we can get rid of this. This is no good. That is no good. We'll find ourselves knowing ourselves greatly in Christ. I pray this Bible study has blessed you today that you will to go back and read through this again and realize how Paul was helping us to realize how easy it is to put our confidence in the things of our flesh when we should put no confidence there that we would turn and put our confidence fully in Christ and in that way we don't have misplaced confidence but certainty in the one who has done all for us that in every way we can know ourselves fully in him to know Christ is to know you. Because in Christ we find out who we truly are, God's people. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of this word. Thank you for this time of teaching and sharing. And I pray that we would examine the places of our misplaced confidence, things we put our trust in that truly do us no good. They benefit us not at all. But yet we found them as places that seem to ease tension for us. Um, they have seemed to be a simple way of going about life. But only to find them fail and find ourselves frustrated. Find ourselves fearful. Find ourselves looking to place fault and blame everywhere else except for on ourselves. Because we were the ones who chose to put our confidence there. But yet, oh Lord, you were gracious, gracious to us that we could confess and that we could count those things as loss for the gain of knowing Christ. That in Christ we could know ourselves, that we come to know you more through Christ Jesus, that in the fullness of all that you called us to be, we can continue in the fellowship, we can continue in our faithfulness, knowing that no matter what crisis, what problem, what challenges, what changes come into our lives, we could yet rejoice. Rejoice in the shortest of certainty that the power of the resurrection that's at work in us sees us through times of suffering, brings us into great experiences of Christ for the life we live to your glory. Bless us now as we leave this study time, but never your divine, holy, wonderful, and excellent presence. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. We pray that you've been blessed by the study, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you for being a part of our worship service on today. Please take note of the following announcements and upcoming events. on YouTube and Facebook or visit our website at buellagrove.org.